the the capital institute uh summer program and i've, I've started on that and uh yeah it's um beautiful to see such an aligned community and uh, so many people obviously focused on on the same issues we are so yeah i'm really grateful to be part of that this summer john so thank you good well i'm i'm glad uh we snuck you in the back door <laughs> you'll uh you'll give more than you receive i know for sure well it's it's, it's for me it's just one of the greatest joys I have in life is weaving people together where I just have a really deep intuitive knowing that they've got work to do together. <laughs> and um, when I met both of you, or when I met Ronnie, um, after having known John for quite a few years now, um, I, it was just clear that um, I know a community that you should be part of, Ronnie, and I'm so glad that you already are now with the, with the course. So, um, yeah, it, it, I, I'm basically just a little mouse trying to e eavesdrop on the conversation between the two of you. but for, for the sake of of maybe making this a, a recording if you at the end both agree for the voices of the regeneration um maybe it'd be nice like because this is like it's, it's unheard of to have the opportunity to speak to two people who were definitely in the top 100, but probably more like the top 50, possibly top 10 of global financial industry um, at some point in their life. And- People? <laughs> and, 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 and have understood that, <laughs> that that whole card house is deeply rotten. And not only that, it, it is gr crumbling already. Like the, the bottom cards have been pulled out and we, it's just the tower is falling in slow motion. So we're we're not quite getting it um, yet, and some people are still denying it. So I I, I would just love to hear um, from both of you briefly. I know you've told this so many times this story, but the 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 brief story of how did you get from being in the center of the financial industry to saying no there's there's something more to life and actually i have a responsibility of working on an alternative maybe i'll pass over to john first <laughs> well first let me clarify <clears throat> in finance we measure people based on their bank account and <laughs> i don't know about ronnie but i was nowhere near the top 100 much less the top 10 um but just, to, role, just to set the record straight. Okay, but if if it's measured in that way, um, may, what, what I meant in terms of the the role in the system. Um, I mean, you were really high up at J.P. Morgan, and and Ronnie was at Deutsche Bank, and a number of other large banks. Um, so, for me, for, forgive me, my my, my late no, no, no. way of judging it. It it feels to, like you were to, really uh, high up in the system. <laughs> So uh, to an answer your question, my um, I, I first have to explain why I went to Wall Street before I explain why I left, because it's different than most people probably think. Um, you know, I I um, I actually went to work at a at a commercial bank that used to be called Morgan Garney Trust Company right out of college in 1982, because I was very interested in this idea that um, finance and economics would replace politics as the kind of global organizing um, glue uh, of, of, of humanity. And that, that was a, you know, that I took a course in college that was all about globalization, and it, it, you know, I switched my major from international relations to economics, and so I, I was, I was pursuing it for a reason other than just this is where I can go make money. And um, there's a long story behind this, but the gist of it is that once you get in the system, uh, you get seduced into the excitement and entrapment of wow, you can make a lot of money here. Um, but it was also a really exciting time. I mean, I, I caught the derivatives wave right at the beginning. Uh, I was in Tokyo, London, New York, and, you know, there was nothing, I have nothing to apologize about it. It was, it was a fantastic experience. Um, super creative, smart people, um, by and large ethical business. And, um, 
but I, I, I had this sort of growing itch over the years and sort of a persistent inner voice was causing me to get restless. And so I'd move from one part of the bank to the other, and I moved from one asset class to another, and then out of capital markets into investing. And um, ultimately, when the merger with Chase happened, it kind of gave me the excuse to walk away because, um, you know, candidly, when mergers happen, all your stock options vest. So there was no cost to to leave. And um, And the culture, the reason that many of us stayed at Morgan for a long time is it had a really unique culture. And with the merger with a big bank like Chase, the old Morgan culture was clearly going to be changed and it had already changed. And so, you know, I left on intuition. Um, and then I went into this dark search phase of my life where I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know who I was. And um, it almost by chance, I discovered the environmental crisis as a systemic issue. I, I discovered there's something called system science, but it was all post Morgan sort of self-taught re-education during the period of the, basically during the period between when I left, which was 2001 and the financial crisis. And, and that period in my life, which was kicked off by 9-11, which I experienced firsthand. It was really kicked off by quitting my job then 9-11, then years of searching. And um, and when the financial crisis happened in 2009, suddenly my friends didn't think I was crazy anymore. So that's my, that's the gist of my story. How about you, Ronnie? Ronnie. Yeah, um, I feel like, th like they're parallels, except that uh, you both were obviously well ahead of me by more than a decade in, in seeing, you know, really what's there. Um, I qualified as a barrister with a wig on my head uh, and very quickly realized I wanted money. And so I went straight, you know, I bypassed being a lawyer and went straight into the investment banks and I describe it as a renting my soul for a best part of more, you know, more than a decade with them, about 15 years in investment banks. And I was in the capital markets group, uh, convertible bond origination. It was a great schooling ground. You know, you learn the entire capital structure from derivatives to equity to credit. Um, and I mean, it, you know, I think in the first week of uh, my training there, uh, you know, they showed me the uh, models for, for option pricing and there's this infinite growth piece in the model and I was scratching my head. Even then I was like, but does that mean just things grow forever? But that doesn't make sense to me. So I was just going to put that aside and ended up uh, moving to Hong Kong with the banks and, you know, kept doing it. Didn't really enjoy it, but I was good at it and they kept promoting me and they kept paying me more. Uh, and I ended up at a senior position at Morgan Stanley running uh, equity capital markets uh, and was, you know, invited to the big dinner in New York with, you know, the top 100 bankers as a firm. And it wasn't at all what I expected it to be. Um, I guess I'd had some romanticized idealism about, you know, what the leaders uh, in the industry would be thinking about their place in, in society. And there was none of that. I mean, the conversation was uh, um, uh, beyond disappointing. Uh, and uh, you know, very soon after, um, I, I was unhappy for a long time. And even though I was getting senior and senior, I, I sort of said to my bosses that this was not going to be long term for me. And I was very fortunate. I had an amazing uh, uh, boss. And, you know, he let me go to your point, John, with my stock, which allowed it to be, you know, allowed me to be released from the golden handcuffs. Um, and I left and this was in 2012 to be a conscious capital entrepreneur for, for want of a better term, but things that I thought were building businesses, which are good for the planet, you know, as a, as a banker, um, you know, I think there's some amazing things that finance and, and bankers do and you know there are a lot of amazing people in the industry um but ultimately uh the the forces i think have corrupted it to to quite an extreme extent and i and i was witness to 
a number of examples of that during my career. You know, obviously the financial crisis we saw, um, you know, one MDB, uh, John, we've had a few email exchanges on. Mm. Uh, and we absolutely know, you know, what a horrifying situation uh, that ended up being for, for the Malaysian people. Um, yeah, so being conscious capital entrepreneur for the last 10 years and you know, things changed for me and uh, materially again in 2019. Um, I was really focused on adapting our existing system, like building businesses, which I thought, you know, in some way help the existing system be better. And in 2019, I met a climate scientist uh, in the summer of that year. And we ended up having a dinner in October of 2019. And it was the most depressing dinner of my life. Uh, she had lost, she's a very senior uh, climate scientist and she'd lost all climate hope. Um, I was like, well, I'm working on this. I know smart people working on this. This is gonna be tried. No, can't work, won't work. Um, and you know, that night I left the dinner, I couldn't sleep. Um, and uh, forgive me for rolling this story on, but I think it's, it's helpful no. to give you both context. And then I was in Bali in uh, November of 2019. So, sorry, in October of 2019, we have a dinner, yeah. And then in November of 2019, I was in Bali. And, you know, I was doing my healing journey, my self-work, you know, the yoga journal, meditate, cry routine, uh, which was uh, very productive for me. And I was, you know, in a small juggalo, um, not reaching out to friends and really just doing my work. And one evening I decided to read an article uh, which my climate scientist friend had sent me. Uh, and we were all receive so much media uh, and we read maybe 5% of it, 10% of it. And for whatever reason that evening uh, on my own in my juggalo, I decided to read this article. And the article was called Transcending Our Existential Risks Through Collective Intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, something happened to me that evening. Um, I was pacing around, I couldn't get it out of my head, my brain started to, to, to whir. And I, you know, suddenly came into this whole body sense of knowing, uh, like every cell, every fiber in my body came to this like <laughs> point where I was like, I can see how we can solve our global challenges, mm. which is a massive statement and a ridiculous to make, but, <laughs> but I felt it in my body. And, um, I essentially what came to me was this, was that we have the will. If you ask the majority of the planet, they want to so solve our global challenges. We have the capital, there's plenty of money. Uh, we have the technology, in particular blockchain. The, now ignore all the noise and all the crypto mess that's been the last few years, et cetera, et cetera. But the ability for humanity to interact and scale without middleman or hierarchy is a game changer for our species. So we have all of those things. So, so what's our problem? Uh, well, in, in my mind, it was, well, it's, it's our economic and governance systems are no longer fit for purpose. And, and hey, we can design new ones and we can put them on our phones. And in my version of the vision, we can distribute it to all these authentically engaged people around the world who are already there from a conscious le consciousness level. And, you know, then I kept pacing around a lot and I finally went to sleep that night and I got up in the morning and I woke up and I just laughed. I was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to do nothing with this. Zero. I wouldn't know where to start. I've just been through a divorce. I've got multiple co-founder and other businesses. Too much of my play. I'm not going to. Nonsense. Wouldn't know. Wouldn't. Don't really know what I'm doing. And a Basically, a month later, uh, I was at an event in, in Thailand, uh, and I was sharing this crazy idea that I had, because obviously I couldn't stop thinking about it. And that people were saying, well, that's not crazy. I was like, okay. And then I shared it with someone else who's very senior in the finance world. I said, do you think I'm insane? And they went, no, I don't think you're insane enough. Uh, <laughs> and that Sunday of the event, I ended up uh, hosting a lunch for a bunch of people and more people were brought along to the lunch by the guy that said I wasn't crazy. And he asked me to share that vision I just shared with you that we have the will, the capital technology and it's our systems that, that require uh, a rethink. And as I was sharing it, a guy in the audience basically went white. He looked at me and said, we're building it. And mm -hmm. I was like, F you, you're building it. 
like, <laughs> and grilled him for an hour and a half in front of everyone. Cause I, I, I'd been thinking about it. What about this? How do you deal with this, et cetera. And long story short, we came together after that. And uh, we were in Thailand at the time. And of course he lived five minutes away from me in Bali. We agreed <laughs> to meet after the event. He came and then he showed me everything that they had, he'd been working on. And it was all the stuff I'd written when I first left banking about my thoughts about the democratization of finance and some of the concepts of Rifkin moving from corporate capitalism to individual capitalism uh, and, and many other things. And I was like, you know, it was like, it was like myself 10 years ago coming back right in front of my face and I had no choice. And so in 2019, I joined uh, the, well, joined the, the collection of people that were, were, were coming together um, and that team's called the Haifa team. Uh, and uh, I'd love to share more with you guys about uh, what that is and that pursuit of this very moonshot goal, which frankly um, has been experimental for most of the last four years. And uh, we've been called, you know, insane, crazy by pretty much everyone for every reason you can imagine. But over the last six months, we've stopped hearing that. Uh, and we moved out of experimental phase. And I think, I believe we have something very special now. So I'm really looking mm. forward to sharing. That. Wow. I can't wait to hear more about it. I, 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 I can't remember if in our emails we discussed it, but I have stumbled into Haifa and Seeds a few times. Um, most recently, uh, I think there's, uh, I, the, do you know Kate Bennett? Hmm. So Kate, yeah. Kate has been in our course community and she's, she brought, you know, the whole DAO and, and crypto conversation alive in one of the economics courses. And, and she connected me with a bunch of other people, but I, I started to go to school on seeds and then I got distracted and whatnot, but I, um, I have a, I have an intuition on that, that, it, that you guys are absolutely um, you know, it's like the language showing up at the moment we need a new language. You know, it's it's it is pretty hard to imagine how we're going to reconstruct the system with the existing institutional framework. And um I just I just I just view it as as sort of this magical um you know evolutionary process that that as soon as we create a problem that's too complex. Not me or you? Uh oh. Am no. I am I tuning out? No, I think he no. he just froze. Uh, Let's see. Let's see. I'm very curious to to hear more from Ronnie because I I'm I'm somewhat on the fence with all these um, crypto. There he's back. Ah, there we are. Yeah. Ronnie, can you hear us? I'm going to change my I'm going to change my signal to something better. Okay. I I can now. I lost you for a bit. I'm just going to see if I can. I think we're working now. Okay. Cool. Yeah. You're yeah, you're, uh, you're moving again. <laughs> I was I was just saying that that it would help me if you explain, Ronnie, for somebody who's a bit on the the luddite side of the spectrum. Um, maybe it's just assuming that there might be some people listening who, despite the fact that they've heard about blockchain and um, crypto and all of this, like assume nothing and start as simple as possible. So um, everybody who's listening can kind of find an entry point. Yeah. And Ronnie, let me just sure. finish the, um, let, me, so let me just finish the, let, let, oops. let me just finish the, the thought I had, because I think it'll be a, a, a good segue for you. Um, <clears throat> what, I, what I was saying when you, you lost your signal is that um, the the challenges that we're facing really demand a new language, a new technology frame to deal with them? Or it becomes pretty clear that the current level of complexity that humanity, human society has reached, is 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 in real trouble. And one of the um, one of the ideas that I latched onto years ago was this idea of complementary currencies, and and we both share this, um, you know, attraction to living systems. And Bernard Leotard 
more than anyone I know, but but there's a whole community of people that were pursuing this idea of a diversity of currencies as opposed to the monoculture currency we have now. And I, I always felt that was a an important piece of the story, but not like the people that are into money, that's like, that's the silver bullet, you know? But I know one thing I would just share before you, you, you share about Haifa is that I know Bernard before his death was, um, he had become depressed, honestly. And, and here's a guy who literally invented the Euro and the Euro was misappropriated from his original idea. And he spent much of the rest of his career promoting this idea of complementary currencies, not, you know, an alternative single currency to other to national currencies. And, um, you know, he, the, the technology, the technology didn't exist to allow this to really spread, even though there are plenty of examples of little success stories. And he, when he discovered blockchain, he was like reinvigorated as a human being. And, and he worked with one of the initiatives, I forget which one, probably until his death. But, um, but at any rate, there's a, there's a pathway to the work you guys are doing that makes it to me, highly likely that what you're doing is profound. And it's, um, it, it will play a role in what what we're all wrestling with in, in, in a way that I certainly don't understand and probably none of us understand yet. But anyway, I'm, I just wanted to give you that uh, uh, on-ramp to sharing your story. Well, I, I really appreciate that, John. And uh, it's, it's, it's really gratifying um, and reassuring to hear other people uh, see what we've seen and to understand it and to to really realize what 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 we what we're building and what we've built um because it hasn't been easy i'm not going to pretend this journey has been an easy one it's been mm. incredibly challenging um so we came together as a team in 2019 uh, and we called ourselves hypha h y p h a hypha is the node on the mycelium that facilitates connection and we came together to build seeds, a regenerative currency, a currency which is owned, governed, and uh, uh, ability to be adapted by the people that use it. And we very quickly realized right at the beginning that, okay, if we wanna build this new paradigm or this new currency, it's the Einstein principle. You can't build the new system from the old system. So we realized at Haifa, we needed to be decentralized ourselves right from the beginning. And back in 2019, there weren't tools to allow a decentralized team to operate, to make agreements, to compensate and exchange value. So we built our own tools and, and those tools are the Haifa DAO tools. Um, now we did something which, uh, I guess I can, what we did was we used the DAO to build the DAO. So we used this technology to actually build it. And that was incredibly challenging thing to do. And, you know, I would say never do that <laughs> for anyone who's watching this. <laughs> but in retrospect, it was the harder path up the mountain. But now we, I think we have something incredibly special as a result. Because obviously we're a DAO building DAO tools while we're eating our own dog food. So what is that? I, I want to stop for a second and just talk about what a DAO is. Um, so people, can, can the, the, the you, term can, is decent. Can, can you can you actually answer a different question before you explain a DAO? What what is it about decentralization that and decentralized governance that got you like? that's the essence of the problem that we need to solve? That's a great question. It's ultimately about collective intelligence. If we're talking about the most challenging uh, the risks that we have to transcend, um, they're highly, highly complex problems. The regeneration of our planet is such an interconnected, complex challenge that I don't believe any one company, any one CEO is going to be able to solve it. 
What I believe will solve it is the collective intelligence of humanity. And so how do you harness that power of collective intelligence? Well, it's through collective decision making. It's not me being the boss. It's not you being the boss. It's us all working together and sharing our views. And that means not always the results that come out are the ones I want. And look, I'll be honest with you, at the beginning of the Haifa Dow story, it was collective unintelligence, let's be honest, right? It was very, very challenging. And we have these issues of tragedy of the commons and other, other issues. But over time, the uh, collective intelligence machine, if you want to describe it like that, got smarter and smarter and smarter. And it's the ability to provide outsized uh, alpha or outsized decisions that come from it that wouldn't have come from a single source. Uh, now, once you layer on collective, once you decide the collective intelligence is such a grand prize well then there are other key features of these DAOs which become very important the other pieces are transparency and secure systems and for me transparent and secure systems are, are the antithesis of tyranny and corruption you can't have tyranny and corruption if you have transparency and you can't alter the record so if you pull collective intelligence transparency and a secure system together um, you, in my view, have a very credible operational governance and economic systems for our future, which can solve these highly complex challenges, which us individuals can't. Ronnie, Ronnie they, there's one bit that I'm not sure I follow logically, which is you somewhat equated um, collective intelligence and collective decision making. Mm. And um, in the in the kind of analog sandbox of collective decision-making in a pancake way with everybody around the circle having equal voting rights and so on. I've, I've lived that in intentional community experiments. Um, I've seen it over and over and over and over again throughout the Global Eco-Village Network. And in many ways, sociocracy and holocracy evolved because consensus didn't work. Um, and so they, it's actually not that easy, collective decision making, and what if the analogy uh, analogy of of having experienced it in the analog holds in the digital, the the bit that I'm a bit concerned about is that it's not necessarily the most informed and most capable that have the patience to sit through that process of collective intelligence making around a certain problem. And the system starts self-selecting for those who are geeky enough to love hanging out on the computer and voting on things, for those who are in a stage in their career where they kind of go, oh, this could be big, so I might as well put some time in, in into this. And those who kind of say, can't really put my information in, and and insights everywhere because there's not enough time in the day might just opt out of that and they might be exactly the people who hold aspects of that collective intelligence we so desperately need um that you, do you follow my my concern a hundred percent and we lived your concern uh at the beginning of our journey for sure um Look, most DAO builders out there are really concerned with a community managing a treasury. What we wanted to do and what we've done is really create the constructs that would allow an organization to function, a company, if you like, to function. And what we realized right at the beginning, which we, we, we know from, from other people's previous experience in the real world, as, as you described, that... You have engagement issues, people, you know, are the right people engaging? You have expertise issue, are the right people engaging? Um, and so having everyone vote on everything doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Even though you want that collective pool of decision making, uh, that isn't going to get you to the place that, that is a collective intelligence in our view. So what we've been working with, and we've played with different structures and different governance structures to see what would work um, over the past four years for ourselves. 
Uh, and what we're coming to the conclusion on right now is, you know, it's, it's biomimicry plant tech, if you like, following the patterns of nature, is that we're focused on a, a cell nucleus, if you like, of 150 people, which we would determine or call the action space. And then there can be a community donut around it that can be a million, two million, 10 million people that you can interact with. Now, there are certain decisions that you want that 10 million crowd to give some wisdom on. And so they would vote maybe on certain actions. But the majority of the core everyday action space would be determined by those 150 people. Now, once you're at the nucleus, the 150 people, we even need to go more granular. So let's say we have, we, we use circles within the nucleus. So we have a, let's simplify it. We have a market, go to market circle, a product tech circle and a finance circle. Um, if everyone's voting on everything, then when the next developer, his, his role comes up and he wants to renew his role and he's puts it up for a vote, you don't want me as the finance guy voting on that. I have no idea whether he's the right developer, the best developer, and you don't want that becoming a popularity contest, which is where what typically happens. I mean, we know in the banks for the bonuses, that's something that, 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 that you know, is very arbitrary and that's how it happens. So here, to avoid that, we actually make the inner circles autonomous. So we make the nucleus voting on the budget of the inner circle, so the finance circle, the go-to-market circle, or the product circle. And so the, the bigger whole can debudget a circle, but the circle is responsible for it deploying that budget and figuring out who the right people are and you know who's who's doing the best job. So it starts to layer in expertise and engagement into the right places. There are other ways of doing this. At Haifa, our goal is to provide the conditions for the emergence of this collective intelligence. So ultimately, we are not dictating the governance structure. This is one setting in our feature set that you can set if you want to do circle governance. Other people will want to do their governance in different ways. And we just provide a template system for you to be able to experiment with whatever governance you want. We don't have, I wish we did. We, don't, we just don't have all the answers here. What we know is that if we create the right conditions with enough flexibility for the experimentation and keep everything transparent so everyone else can see what's going on and learn from each other, then we're going to get some form of collective intelligence emerging. Uh, and we're also going to get a tremendous amount of cooperation rather than competition because it's transparent systems. We're open source as well. Um, so it goes some way, and it's a quite a level of detail I've gone through there um, to explaining expertise and bringing these factors in. But there are other ways to do this, uh, which are equally as valid. But this is a very highly this is a highly complex problem. And and for somebody who doesn't know how to code and doesn't necessarily want to spend their time learning constantly new ways of engaging with a platform like that um how transparent is that transparency really like if if i set myself the question oh i'd really like to see what these guys at haifa are doing how how much learning would i have to do to even understand what i'm looking at so that's I mean, I smile because that's that's the beautiful thing about what we've created here. Um, we are the we're, we're for every human. You do not need any technical expertise to use our product. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very different to pretty much most of the things you see in blockchain. In fact, it's quite confusing for the blockchain VCs. They're like, oh, how are you going to appeal to the decentralized finance crowd? And I'm trying to explain to them, that's not my market. My market is everybody else, in fact. Um, so you can go on right now to the Haifa DAO with, with no login, nothing, just as a guest. Anyone can do it. And anyone can see what roles I hold, how much I own, how much I'm getting paid. You can see that from the entire DAO. You can see uh, how many you know, tokens are, are issued. You can see our whole economy. It's, it's there and it's transparent. 
Obviously, there's layers of reporting detail, which I think people would necessarily want to know, which we're building in as feature sets to allow people with you know, various you know, bits of reporting transparency uh, to look at the unit as a whole. Uh, but the key the key pieces are already there for every, anyone to see with no no coding experience. And the point of the platform is for, for every human to do it. You know, they call them DAOs. And I think that's a massive misnomer here. Decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, we're not really autonomous. Really what we are is a decentralized human organism. Uh, and that's the way I like to think about it. It's really about putting the human at the center of the technology here uh, and then leveraging the human and the human collaborations. Um, you know, the power of 8 billion humans working together, uh, it's a really interesting counterpoint to all the discussions we're having on AI right now. Yeah, that's um, where my yeah. head is going is how, how does AI interface with this um, it, you know, obviously we don't need to rehash all of the dangers of AI, but, um, I, I've had, I have this, you know, crazy idea that, you know, if we could program an AI with the intelligence of living systems as its algorithm, um, you know, you, you certainly, um, uh, Daniel is familiar with my eight principles. You're you're starting to get exposed to them, but I'm talking about double clicking. You know, ten layers deep, building an algorithm that understands all that, and then asking the AI, okay, how do we fact and 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 loading all of the political constraints, economic constraints, you know, everything. How do we get from here to where we need to be? And it, it's like, it, it, you know, in 30 seconds or three seconds, it will come up with ideas that no no human will ever imagine as, as sort of the pathway through the minefield. Um, like, for example, how do we stand up, you know, X gigawatts of solar power in Africa, given the constraints and the money issues? And so, I don't know, I, I'm curious if you, if you imagine... AI is being embedded in in Haifa DAOs at some point. So look, a hundred percent, yes. Uh, you know, I think to ignore AI is a, in its entirety um, is a very dangerous position to take. Uh, I, I think you're going to get outrun. Um, the way we think about it, at least for now, and it's obviously emergent, is. The human is has his hand on the trigger, so we're we're not wanting to put the AI uh, to to uh, to vote. Put it simply. Now there are obvious areas where the AI can be tremendously valuable. So if we're talking about a community donor of ten million people and they're sharing their views on something, to aggregate and understand their views, the AI is a really good tool to scrape that data set, understand their views, and put it into a digestible format for the people that are making votes to then discuss and move forward. So I think that's a very nice kind of, if you like, say fluffy way for AI to play. A, a little bit more intrusive, but I think very valuable. You know, I foresee in the future of, of, of these, the, the DAO structures is that you have some kind of baseball type scoring systems like, like Ray Dalio has the principles or, you know, maybe even uh, human design concepts in terms of understanding the skill sets of individuals. And then let's say you had a particular project to put together, the AI would be potentially very good at knowing what skill sets are needed and what gaps you may have in the, your current team that you're putting together in order to achieve a positive, you know, a very positive outcome. So I think the AI can be very interesting in terms of looking at that, those combination features of humans and skill sets required to achieve a certain task. Um, the, I mean, the other piece of this is Haifa is a network. Ultimately uh, we, will stick, I think, to what I've just described, at least for the time being. 
But there will be other DAOs in the system that will use our technology and use AI in ways that we can't imagine, nor do we prescribe. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, you know, freedom of choice on, on how you use these technologies. Uh, the one thing that I think is very important as you think about AI and, and the interactions with, with humans and humanity is identity. So, you know, Haifa is beautifully one piece in the system change map. Fortunately, there are many, many other amazing people across the planet who have built who have built amazing solutions that all click together to, in effect, to deliver the system change that I believe is very possible within a very short period of time. And identity and linking human identity and not having the story. I don't know if you heard of that story, but the AI convinced a human to solve the capture for it. Um, so, yeah. you know... You, 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 you've got to avoid all of those pitfalls, um, but but identity in that is a really important part um, of that. Um, and my last thoughts on AI, uh, it's interesting, a lot of people are concerned that the AI is going to become human in some way. I'm actually in some ways more concerned about the, the humans wanting to become AI. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what that means. Um, so we don't really understand the power of the technology that we exist in these bodies. Um, and I believe that that's unfolding and uh, being disclosed to us in some ways uh, in a more rapid pace. And I think we'll find our technologies are are, are much sharper than we, we really understand. It is but program the heart, can you program the gut? I'm not sure the AI is focused on those things. Well, this is fascinating because for, for me, that speaks much more to, to my concern about AI, which is like the, the way you were painting it, um, John, the, the idea, I can see how it's attractive, but um, I keep thinking, what is this language learning algorithm absorbing? It's absorbing images, it's absorbing videos, it's absorbing text, it's absorbing everything we've ever put online. We're at a time where we're talking about decolonialization and listening to inequalities on the planet and all of that. If we just take the very top veneer layer of actually taking that seriously, then it becomes apparent that who has fed all that information into that machine is possibly the most lost generation in the long journey of our species evolutionary mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. What I just heard Ronnie refer to is that maybe one of the biases of that kind of feeding the AI with such technological word analytical thinking based information is that we are enthralled by the technology we've created and think that that's so amazing. But what, maybe, Ronnie, correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, but what I heard you indirectly refer to is that we still haven't really unfolded and understood the power of, for example, the spoken word came in a few 10,000 years earlier um, and it's really changed our species. I just had a conversation with a friend of mine who is a, both an author and, and my publisher in, in, in German. And he asked me, what is a book? Um, and we had a long conversation about what is a book. And then suddenly in that conversation, we realized that a book is, in Buckminster Fuller's terms, a tool, the use of which will change the way people think. Mm. It's the first invention of a long thought of not something you just quickly say a lot around a campfire until people drop away because you've been speaking for too long, holding this talking stick for too long. <laughs> yeah. It's something that you write down and those who are willing to engage, if you've written it engagingly enough, will actually stay with that thought for a long time. And we've seen how that long thought can change history and has done many times. Hmm. And, and so what, I'm just using that as an analogy to say, I think we both in terms of existing technologies like the written word, the spoken word, but also the way of counsel sitting around the fire with a talking stick, rites of passage, um, finding ways to, tra to transition young adults into mature members of a community by making them understand the fundamental structure of life as being in service of 
the only way to understand to, to manifest unique individual potential is in service. And indigenous cultures know that. And we've had all these sacred technologies that stood us really well for to help us survive in an uncertain universe for hundreds of thousands of years. And now we we think that this minute slither of our activity fed into a machine should possibly inform us how to live our lives. And, and because we're so trapped in that narrative, we even believe, and, and intelligent people repeat it. It's like, oh yeah, we're, we're just too stupid. We need the AI to tell us how to solve global problems. Ah. I, I, and I'm not saying that it's not fantastically useful, but I think we're making an error of category of what this tool could actually do. And in doing so, we're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy that this tool could be extremely dangerous because we we give it too much power over us and over life. Well, let me, let me just ju jump in and respond. Yeah. I agree with everything you just said. Daniel, honestly, and I see possibilities to use it as a tool. We, we just need to to know how we're using it and to to see it as a tool to help solve complex, not complicated, complex problems that the human brain um, is is you know is is we struggle to to wrestle with, but. But I, I don't know if we should, yeah, you know, we can have a whole AI conversation thing. about AI. Let me flip it back to yeah. the DAO without AI. Forget AI. The same issue, I think, exists with um, collective intelligence. There's a premise that, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to, to, to articulate this question. I think, I think Daniel and I, share a view, which is that we're at a moment in time where the worldview defined by the moder modern age and modernity has reached its useful limit. And in the, in the modern age, we've made a bunch of progress, but we've also made some very big mistakes, which is rooted in this reductionist thinking versus holistic thinking. But reductionist thinking and and a, a premium placed on analytical thinking, left brain anal an, you know, analysis is the water we swim in. So we we think about problems we need to solve and we 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 use our left brain to solve them. And yet and so therefore all the people collected around your circles in your DAO without thinking about it, are going to likely uh, use that analytical thinking, which is exactly the thinking that solved the problems that we thought we had that created bigger problems that we're now trying to solve. And so in my kind of, you know, struggle to think about a theory of change for humanity, it begins with seeing this new way of seeing, seeing this new way of thinking, looking at through looking at our challenges through a living systems paradigm not because i think living systems are 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 um not because my opinion is living systems matter but because living systems define the reality that we live in like it's it is it it is reality and so if we're going to have a human society a human economy that is sustainable over the long run it seems self-evident to me that it needs to align with that reality. But in your DAO and in the hundreds and thousands of DAOs that will populate the planet with all these advantages, if we don't deploy this new way of thinking, how will we end up with a different outcome? Yeah. That's a good so, question, I, Daniel. <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> and it's the hardest question and I think the one that perhaps you know my old colleagues at the bank would, would struggle with my answer because the answer is is you need a certain level of consciousness yeah uh, to be able to operate in these new systems if I brought the ego I brought when I was you know leading a division of the bank to 
uh, my work in the Dow, I would have been spat out a long time ago, just wouldn't have worked at all. Just the whole way that I operate now is entirely different. Uh, you know, the concepts of leadership without control are, are something that ring around my head a lot in terms of how to still, Dow still need leaders, the concept that there's not, you know, a leadership there is, there's multiple leaders in the DAO and I have an amazing team of, of you know, experts in their field, you know, the, that are all at the same level as me, you know, they're, they're, they're brilliant. Um, so it's, it's, it's a consciousness, it's the ability or, or the willingness to look at yourself a lot of the time. You know, we all bring various, our own traumas to, to, to our work. Um, and when these pop up, for us in our experience over the last four years, it's, oh, wow, this is an opportunity to learn. How can we deal with this human trauma? What does that mean for the Tao? How, does, how do we operate with that to help that human, to help the Tao, which is a reflection of the trauma anyway, um, and, and to move through that so that we're actually coming into a more conscious, thoughtful decision-making process. So, Yes, I believe there will be more DAOs and companies at some point. And I believe that the acceleration, especially with the decline in our existing systems, is going to accelerate. But none of that happens without the other work on consciousness. It just simply doesn't. You, you need that right. as well. Otherwise, you're just going to be people using the technology in, in, the, in the old paradigm. And that, that's not going to work. Um, I, I see you nodding. It's great. I, I think there's a, there's a receptiveness to hear that in this audience. I'm not sure how much a receptiveness there is, yeah. you know, globally to hear that at the moment. But I believe this is about a trim tab to to take the Buckminster Fuller pieces of this. I don't. We don't need to move the whole rudder. We just need to move a piece of the rudder, and the whole thing will start to shift. So the number of conscious people working in DAOs globally. It required to sh create uh, the conditions for true civilization shift are not as many as we would think. Mm -hmm. Just to come back to something that we briefly touched on, uh, John touched on earlier um, when you mentioned Bernard Liatar. Um, I mean, I, I, I remember ever since I was working on my master's in holistic science at Schumacher College 20 years ago, um, there's a guy called Greco who also wrote a book on on uh, money and and um, Margaret Kennedy, who was a very mm. close friend of of Bernard Liatta, um, wrote a number of like in money without interest and and a number of books on regional currencies, and they they then published a bunch of books together. So I I also always sensed that an ecosystem of multiple currencies. From ultra local to out uh, to regional to global currencies that are interchangeable, and not just currencies in terms of money exchange, but also like Bernard's one one of my favorite Bernard projects, which I thought is just pure genius, and I'm surprised that no education system has, to my mind um, or to my awareness, still in, uh, so far implemented it. He worked on something called the Saber for the Brazilian government, in which. Um, starting with primary school or even kindergarten you can start to earn like if you if you one or two years ahead of the kids below you you can just do caretaking tutoring um telling them helping them with their their work in diff different subjects and the time you put in you you earn credits in an alternative currency system called the saber and by the time you get to the point where you could go to university, even if you come from the poorest parts of society, if you've done a lot of this tutoring, you have the money to go to university and 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 it's basically paid for by that system. It, that's a sort of rough sketch of it. Um, but what, what I'm trying to understand with regard to Haifa and what you're enabling with the system that you're like, I'm, I'm getting closer that you're building a system that is the support infrastructure for people to make agreements with each other um, and 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 collaborate on a specific focus, even if they're not co-located. Is that correct? Yeah, not just that. I mean, that, that's right. It, it, it's yeah. it's essentially there's two components to it. There's the agreement machine, which you just described, 
mm -hmm. and the value exchange machine. So, you know, the one amazing thing about HIFO is over the last four years, we operated as a true DAO. We didn't use a bank account, and yet we've paid over 150 contributors over the last four years, um, millions of dollars uh, to create the technology. Uh, so you have a, an ability to make collective decisions and you have an ability to, uh, to, to exchange value all without the existing corporate infrastructure. So the way I like to think of it is if you're a group of people coming together for a common purpose today, what do you typically do? You, you form a company. You go, you create shareholder agreements, your documents, your signing. It takes you a while. You then go and open a bank account if they'll let you open a bank account. Um, and you have to go through all of that. With the DAO, you literally go into the settings, configure a few settings and press a button and you're live. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 you know, it's just faster, cheaper, better uh, by a scale, a magnitude of, of, you know, multiple times. So to give you an example, uh, one of our first paying paying clients or users at, um, at HyperDAO is a, a venture building operation called Tekka. So Tekka are launching 100 climate science startups in Africa, okay? Now, if you were typically to launch 100 climate science startups, that's a lot of paperwork. It's gonna cost you a lot of money and it's gonna take you a long time. And you're gonna be buried in paperwork. It's gonna be a nightmare. Um, so that's a conventional way of launching these organizations. Now, with the Haifa DAO and using our ecosystem model, you can launch an anchor DAO, which the Tekka have done. And they have the ability now to spawn another 100 DAOs straight from their you know, mother DAO, if you like, or anchor DAO. And they have the ability to spawn that with the click of a button. So... Just putting it simply, the company's built for the industrial age, you know, DAOs are built for the digital age, your ability to launch, you know, 100 startups focused on climate science in Africa is game change. You know, it would cost you millions of dollars and take you years. Now it's going to cost you a fraction of that. And once you've set up your governance and economic settings in the mother DAO, you can copy paste that into the 100 DAOs. Well, John, I was just sharing... Um, Sorry, uh, Daniel. Just briefly, so for, pardon my ignorance. Um, when you say you've used the Haifa DAO to um, pay out a number of contributors, like um, because we're sort of like I'm still trying to get alternative currencies and then real currencies together and how these systems in, in interoperate, because you then mentioned dollars. So um, if if these hundred climate science startups want to in different parts of, let's say, East Africa, pay out a national currency to their contributors. How how does it like? How does the DAO function with regard to its interface with the existing financial system and the tax system as well? So, on the currency side, it's about having a multi-currency system. So they get to choose which currencies they want to use. There is a native DAO currency in there. So whatever, if, you, if you're a Tekka, you're going to have your own Tekka currency as well. And that may do something. That may have some utility as well. Um, but again, it's a template system. So I wouldn't get too obsessed about which currency it is or when uh, you can use it. You will be able to deliver value in your chosen medium. So for example, at Haifa, we have delivered value to people with our HIFA token, and that HIFA token is used to um, uh, is, is used to get access to our software, the DAO software, and we're paid in a, a, an accounting term, but in the equivalent of uh, USD as well, because that's what people need right now. So that that flexibility. So where does the U.S. dollars come from? I get where the HIFA currencies come from, the keyboard. Yes. Yeah. But, but where does the U.S. dollars come from? So the U.S. dollars so far for HIFA, those have come from. Uh, it's a U.S. dollar equivalent, so it's an accounting mechanism we use. But we pay in a variety of liquid 
uh, cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin and others. So we've received Bitcoin uh, from, you know, people who've wanted to support us uh, and investors. And we use that and we pay that out to our, hmm. um, our contract. And, and why Bitcoin rather than dollars? Uh, because we can, uh, because we can you send it through the the technology through the system. Uh, so we, we we have never had a bank account. We've never used a bank account. But so Bitcoin is an extremely volatile, blah blah blah. Like the last currency you'd want to get paid every week to cover your kid's education is Bitcoin. Yeah, no, 100%. And we want to see more valid stablecoin alternatives out there. And that's an, an evolution we need to see. So right yeah. now, of course, uh, over the course of our, our lifespan, Hyper, it's actually been a positive holding the Bitcoin because it's gone up net over that period. So it's actually worked mm -hmm. out well from the treasury management perspective. But we're not trying to play that game, obviously. Right. And ultimately, when we pay uh, a developer um, and he receives either Bitcoin or Ethereum or another currency, uh, you know, we're very quick on them to say, hey, notice you're going to about to get this paid. It's very volatile. You need to transact out of it. Um, we've just, I, I've just been wary of a lot of the stable coins out there. At least mm -hmm. Bitcoin is a truly decentralized protocol. Some of the stable coins have elements of centralization, uh, mm -hmm. which then, you know, question the validity. And as you've seen over time, the scares in the stable coin market have, have, have moved those quite significantly and they're not as stable as, as we as we think either so there's a lot of development and evolution on the payment side and what mm. currencies are used and mm. i think it's still pretty early there you mm. know seeds that we've been working on we still need to i would still describe it in dirty growth um it's still got a lot of work the dow solution the dow building tools that we've got they're ready for prime time and that's hugely exciting like we've just mm. launched the alpha and the use cases that are coming up, uh, you know, amazing, like mm. really, really humbling. I'd love to share actually some of those with you. And just before we get into into the weeds, just so so the the DAO tools, your your business is creating tools for people to create DAOs. So if I want to create a DAO tomorrow, I would actually pay Haifa for those tools. Today I pay in Bitcoin, tomorrow it might be something else, but that is the business of Haifa. Is that correct? C correct. That's exactly right. Um, we've actually, you know, we, we don't want, we understand every human is not going to be in the Web3 blockchain space. So we actually make it very simple. It's a SaaS model where you can pay monthly in dollars right. through your credit card in the right. normal way. And we hide, or not hide, but we back end all of the, the, the yeah. crypto. Pieces of it. So you're you're a software company. Your your tools and products and services happen to be DAOs, but people can understand you as a software company. Exactly. It's exactly yeah. who we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're we're there. I mean, our mission is to build technology for a new civilization. That's yeah. a stated mission uh, with equal advantage for all and a lot of Buckminster of fillers. Obviously. Right. And so you were just about to mention a few user cases. Like, let me just ask you some use ideas that I have, whether they would work. For example, if I want to build a stronger, that's why behind me are all the watersheds of the world, um, a, a, a stronger movement of um, regional production for regional consumption and regional value flows and ca capacities for people to invest maybe whatever access values they have stored into um, a bioregional regeneration cooperative that um, builds resilience infrastructure at a local and regional scale and is collectively owned but in a in a real not not in a sort of um like in a in a, in a hard value space or like basically that, that co cooperative owns infrastructure land forests um that kind of thing it would the haifa dao allow me to create in the early stages of that a means of building that network and paying each other 
for what would otherwise be sweat equity, like like basically the, the people put lots of work in to collectively build something, and they might also put some real money investment savings into this, and somehow the system would allow to track all of that and basically give people the confidence that they're shifting from a very volatile, not so sure investment into dollars and euros and, and so on into an investment that is more diversified in the sense of that it is a blended, like it, it is real physical value, but shared within a cooperative. And it creates maybe some form of surplus that you also get some form of participation in. Um, does that does does that make any sense with regard to what the Haifa can do, the Haifa DAO? Yes, I mean it feels like the short answer is that's exactly what we did at Haifa. Okay. Um, the great thing is we we did it ourselves, right? We've we've we we've, we've lived the DAO to mm -hmm. build the DAO, and so that's exactly what happened for us. There's a group of contributors that came together. Yes, there was some cash investments as well. But we all contributed and we all received some voice. So, so voting percentages for our contributions and we received value. And all that value is trackable and transparent for everyone to see. See, the real prize of this is what, what's one of our greatest challenges here? We need to deploy a huge amount of capital into the impact space efficiently and, and quickly. And deploying a huge amount of capital right now is very challenging. And why is that challenging? Well, in part, there's a lack of transparency. So if you have a transparent system and you've seen uh, the, the Tekka example, the 100 climate science startups that they're launching and they launch it through an ecosystem of DAOs. Well, let's say the initial capital is done by Tekka and they spawn these 100 DAOs and then you're looking for follow-on capital. Well, all of a sudden, you can look into that DAO, the anchor DAO, and all of those sub DAOs, and you can see which ones have performed. Importantly, exactly where the money's gone and for what, and what the results are. So you have a, an ability to do a level of due diligence here that you've never ever been able to do. It's not a, it's not possible in our existing system. And so, if you're doing the work and you have more information, you should be getting higher returns. And so for me, you know, for me, it's all about, you know, profit and, and impact together. I, I want to change the incentive system to make it the incentive for everyone to, to, to do the good. And so if you have an ability to deploy capital much faster in a transparent way, you're going to get those better returns. And that, to me, is a really interesting piece of this. Mm. Does that make but the the that that I I agree with everything you just said about the challenge, but the that's only part of the challenge. the The other challenge is that it's hard to start businesses, and business is hard, and that and this doesn't change that. Um, and 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 you know the 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 rules of the system make a lot of things that need to happen uneconomic or dicey economics or risky economics. And so the, the money doesn't flow downhill, whether it's flowing downhill with transparency around it so that it's easier to flow downhill. It's still downhill. It still goes to, likes to go downhill. And I think most of the well-intended impact money looking to get deployed is looking to get deployed going downhill. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I acknowledge it's only one part of the challenge. Yeah, I think you know the ecosystems of DAO model do facilitate cooperation in a way that you don't normally see. Yeah, uh, so that helps. Uh, you know, as part of the hyper network, I think about fifteen percent of our DAOs currently are, are service DAOs. They're essentially there to support the other DAOs. Mm. Uh, so that true ecosystem support that you might see in Y Combinator or somewhere else to help, you know, de-risk uh, some mm. of that startup risk you have in, I think, a turbocharged way in, in, in transparent ecosystems. So that mm. goes some way to helping that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I want to apply, you know, human design and, you know, combinators and, and some of the principles and things like that into the systems mm -hmm. as well, that will also help minimize the, the, the number of failures. The other piece about the ecosystem uh, design is that you can have entities within the ecosystem that are required but don't need to be profitable, right? So that is much easier to take care of within an ecosystem model because it's much more obvious with the, with the value flows. Mm. Uh, to enable that to happen so that's another oh, that's interesting that helps. so so some of the some of the currency flowing through a dao ecosystem could easily be what we would today call philanthropy a hundred percent and that's interesting the, i mean dao's for philanthropy for ngos and charities i mean that's a massive game changer like yeah. all the infrastructure costs are gone your, uh, you know, your visibility on deployment of that capital is dramatically increased. I mean, let me give you uh, on the charity. Let me give you a really good, good, good example of, of DAO use cases. Um, and actually, this, this we were you know, spending some time with Kate Meta, who you mentioned earlier, uh, on this on, on this use case, uh, which is disaster relief. Okay, so when you have a, an earthquake in, in in Turkey that we sadly had fairly recently. Uh, what's our biggest challenge is getting resources on the ground uh, and effective within hours. What happens they, in days or weeks, if you're lucky, which is mm -hmm. in reality what happens. And then there are lots of scams asking for money and people donate and that money doesn't go the right place. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a mess. Well, envisage this within minutes mm -hmm. of a disaster happening. You have a DAO that's spawned in that area. It already has the predefined roles required uh, to assist in that type of disaster. Hey, we need heavy equipment. We need, you know, engineering expertise. We need health mm. safety expertise. And locals can populate that roles. And at the same time, investors or, or uh, philanthropists can fund into that instantly. Right. With, with transparency. Complete trust. With yeah. complete trust. Yeah. So. A very obvious to me near-term use cases in disaster relief. It's fantastic. Yeah. That's that's yeah. a really exciting one that doesn't require any any shift. It's just already better, faster, cheaper. Yeah. So just just briefly sticking with that example and the the, the complete trust, like uh, locals populating the roles. Like so, okay, you get you're saying like um, we need more first emergency first aid first responders on the on the scene, and anybody who might have that skill could just sign up for it. And the trust and transparency is if they signed up for it and they don't deliver because they've signed up for it, there's a track record of it. And so the system would learn that they're not delivering and feedback quickly. Is that correct? Yes, um, that is correct. I mean, you're going to need to you know, link into some real world systems there or old world systems there. Um, you know, we, we, over time, the DAOs and the network of DAOs solve the lying on the CV issue, right? <laughs> because you're going to be able to see what design they did, how much they got paid, and it's all very transparent. Um, for now, we're in that bridge situation. So we're, there's going to be need to be some understanding of, of what they're capable of, mm. um, for sure. Uh, but people get voted into these roles as well, and you need to have some kind of diligence effective speedy diligence uh to to make sure you're getting hey you need a doctor okay this guy's really a doctor let's get him in like you know within hours and make these decisions so that you can get teams on the ground um maybe it's helpful to share some other use yeah, cases yeah. with you guys because i think it spurns a lot you know i described the venture builder that's launching 100 launching 100 climate science startups uh, I think you know that's where we're really spending a lot of our time. It's training the trainers because they're going to provide the exponential growth in in, in DAO growth globally. So, uh, you know, we 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 train one, and they will launch a hundred DAOs. Um, the other interesting use cases that have come up very early for us is on the socio political side. Uh, which is super interesting. So we've been very embedded with the Independent National Convention in the US, uh, and that's looking at using the DAOs and the voting machines to help uh, vote in a primary candidate 
for the independents. Now, obviously, the independents don't typically have their own candidate. That's the definition of an independent, mm-hmm. but that, that's not going to work. Uh, so they're looking to use our software to, to do that. And that's a very interesting use case, not for this coming election, but in state elections and then into hopefully uh, 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 the, ne- the next cycle. Um, uh, dissidents from Myanmar looking to use the technology uh, to organize to essentially take back their country. Um, so those sociopolitical sides have come up very early for us. Um, and and we, it's not something we've chased, but it's come to us. And the DAO is a really powerful tool uh, to be able to self-organize and deliver a transparent uh, process that some that people can trust as you're going into elections. And that's obviously very topical. Mm. Exciting. Mm. I mean, we've just applied for one of the open AI grants as well, um, but obviously deciding, uh, you know, the goods, the ins and outs and what's good or not for AI, well, that should be a collective intelligence process done through DAOs mm. as well. That's another obviously very, very obvious use case. Um, but it's extraordinary. I mean, we've got 100 DAOs in our alpha and we're moving to beta in a couple of months. And the use cases that are coming to us, uh, you know, not always use cases that we've, you know, thought of. Mm. And um, the way I like to think of this is, it's it's almost the opposite of a company, right? In a company, you you, you know, you've got your you get your base right, and then when you want to scale, it's quite complicated to scale. With a DAO, what we're doing is you're perfecting the first cell, and that's a lot harder honestly, than getting an original company going, right? Mm-hmm. There are some efficiencies here, you can't hide them. But the prizes, if you get that, or when you get that first cell right, the copy paste function to copy mm-hmm. and paste that across the planet is extremely fast. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's rapid acceleration in terms of scaling. And that's really interesting. I love yeah. you guys smiling. No, we've, I think we both just got triggered because we're, 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 you, you have to understand that um, both John and I are indoctrinated by um, the regenerative crowd. And um, one of the, the strong triggers of, of anything regeneration is copy paste um, in the sense that it's only regenerative if it's fundamentally place sourced and it comes out of um, the participation of people in place. And um, even to the point of finding ways to ask place itself, not just human ideas about place, of what wants to be born. So, so, so the the, the copy paste thing just—I um, don't know if that, that was the same reason why John's finger went up, but um, that—that's what triggered me. But before you you answer, or John gets a chance to say what what, what his thing was, <laughs> just put something in the chat which I wanted to also mention. Like, Ronnie, you. I think I saw that you're in touch with um, Thomas Schindler and possibly Sebastian Fitko. So, so are you aware of Motherland, that project in Africa? Um, because they, but basically what Sebastian and Thomas have done, they're both coming from a tech space and have start, uh, created very successful tech startups. And they've created conditions for themselves where they can now focus on on doing good with the businesses that they built running in the background, so to speak. And one of the things that they've co-created is Motherland, which is understanding that if you want to create a, a startup in Africa to solve a certain issue in a regional context, it's not enough to set up one startup. Uh, it's bound to fail. You actually have to set up an entire regional ecosystem of what this startup relates to. And 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 what you're telling me sounds so close to that. That, that uh, Are you already in conversation b- with them about possible uh, links? Just, just yeah, we, th- thanks to you for, for, for suggesting and Thomas, to Thomas to reach out to me. He did. We had an initial discussion and you know, there were, were, were basically fireworks. So um, we're, we're having a follow-up discussion, I think, tomorrow. And there's lots to dive into, um, given his expertise in, you know, playing with with with, with currencies um, and the currency side and and what he's doing in, in Africa. So there's a lot of overlap there. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to, to weaving together. So I appreciate that. Thank you.
But yeah, John, what triggered you? And, and what about the copy paste thing? Um, well, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a little different. I mean, obviously, I I I do share the 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 triggered. I, I had I had a multiple trigger. Um, I, I share the trigger Daniel described. Um, although I, I, I run around the world saying things like, um, if we only get clear on the first principles of how life works, we will see that the principles show up everywhere. Um, every snowflake is unique, but every snowflake looks like a snowflake. So the context in a, one place, it will be totally different than the context in another place, but the first principles apply because they're first principles of how life works. And, and um, what, so, so, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm less triggered by copy paste, provided that the copy paste is organized around first principles. And I'm not just advocating for quote my first principles. You know, the, there are lots of ways to describe how life works, um, and this kind of goes back to the earlier question I asked. And 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 it, there, for sure, we share the view that this is part of a rising consciousness, and I, I'm sure Daniel will agree. To work in this regenerative space requires higher consciousness than, you know, many people are, are ready for. But I've seen lots of examples of, quote, rising consciousness in business, which is not shifting out of the extractive paradigm. It's just being nicer while we <laughs> do the extractive paradigm. And I don't want to name names, but, you know, one of the leaders of the conscious business movement would probably be an example of that. So um, I, I, um, my, my trigger, which isn't really a trigger, it was a, an aha. Um, again, Daniel and I share a passion for the need for education and, and probably better said dis, dis education or uneducation and then re-education. Um, and, you know, we all do our little thing. I run my little course measured in tens and hundreds of people. And we're talking about re-educating a billion people or even a million people, you know, whatever the tipping point is, but it's a big amount of people. And I, I say this with all humility. I don't believe we get where we need to go unless people begin to think through this regenerative paradigm because in part we'll keep making mistakes and in part because we won't find the regenerative potential we need to get where we need to go, which gets right back to your earlier comment on how your software is creating the conditions for emergence to happen. I mean, that's, that's where the intersection is. So how do we use Haifa tools to exponentially um, scale in a good way, this re-education uh, essential, is essential, you know, first, to me, it's the foundation upon which all these companies we can create or DAOs we can create needs to be built. So should Capital Institute become a DAO? I think you should definitely have an element of the DAO in there. Yeah, um, I'm not, prescribing that every corporation or every company tomorrow goes and becomes a DAO. I don't think that's realistic, but do I, Nike won't be a DAO tomorrow. Will Nike use a DAO in the next few years to maybe launch the Olympic sneaker for LA? hundred percent. Like, yeah, I would be shocked if they didn't because mm. uh, it's the one way really to engage your user and your consumer base. Um, yeah. The, the one thing that, um, sorry, slightly, a tangent to what you said, but 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 on topic is one thing that gives me a lot of encouragement is it's not my generation or your generation. Yeah, I know. it's the young seem to have this in their DNA. I know, I agree. Like they're well ahead of us. It's it's so reassuring and beautiful to see. Mm -hmm. So 
in two years time, 25% of the workforce is going to be Gen Z, right? The current employer base is struggling with the great resignation, conscious quitting, people want purpose, they don't want to work for the man, I would say the woman as well, but it's not really that, let's be honest. So um, what do they want? Well, the, uh, the studies are coming out and they're saying they want autonomy, they want congruence, yeah. uh, they want shared value and they want shared voice. And to me, that's the Dow. So I think, I, I think it's a generational thing. I think they have it in their DNA. And as some understanding, Mother Nature is very, just much smarter than us and ensuring the generations that are coming through are the ones that are going to solve, you know, our greatest challenges. And I think it's, it's, it's our job as the, if you, uh, if you like the leaders that we don't see, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's our job to, to provide the emergent conditions to allow them to do that. Mm. Uh, and I think that's our task and to do it without ego because, yeah you know, running around saying it's me, 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 just, just it's not going to do it. Mm. So that's the way I look at that. So I'm optimistic. I mean, that's, that's interesting because it, it, what I've already ob observed a little bit with the millennial conversation, now Gen Z conversation, it, it, of course, on the one hand, I completely agree. It's wonderful to see how um, by by necessity when you're young you need to be positive about the future and so you, you can't you can't live into a future that that um is all disastrous and people are waking up to the reality of climate change and and the the tumultuousness of the changes that are going to come but what what i'm as i heard you just now like sensing in my own personal relationship with technology a danger that i would will soon be left behind behind with all of this because i'm not engaging enough like i remember a couple of years ago doing a bunch of um online teaching sessions for a course that was paid in seeds but simply because for me the entry point of getting a digital crypto wallet it was too much i never even bothered to um transfer those seeds that i could get paid um, in into a place where I could store it. Um, the re the reason I'm mentioning that this is that over and over again in the history of humanity, um, we are throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and we are forgetting to pick up the wisdom in the old system or the wisdom in the elder, um, the, the 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 life experience and so on, um, in new steps of where technology enables a new jump. And so, how do we, on the one hand, celebrate? this engagement of Generation Z um, and marry it with a kind of, not the kind of academic ego of, didn't you see I said this 50 years ago, look, listen to me. No, not that, but but where it actually has content, not, not a, where it's about um, just celebrating wisdom in the past just because somebody might have been 50 or 100 years ahead of their time like Patrick Geddes was but where there's still real value to be picked up in what comes from the the, the older generations I mean this is this is slightly a change in topic but 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 it's related like how how do you um make sure that you don't get a bias of only that younger generation enga engaging in these tools and you then by default lose a lot of the wisdom. Mm. There's another half hour conversation. Exactly. <laughs> We've only got, you, how long do you, much, you don't have much longer, John, do you? Like you, I, I really should, uh, I, I don't have a hard stop, so don't, you know. Yeah. But when you should, I, you should read up. I, I, I have a hard stop that I'll get in trouble with my life partner if I don't get to work here. Yeah, uh, I hear you. But yeah, I don't think we're, there's so much in this space that we could go on for, for quite a long time. Um, <laughs> we have done. But um, I still, yeah, I still don't 100% get how do we... How do we make the most out of these tools? I, I I intuitively get they're super important, but I also see so many pitfalls um, in the 
wedding ourselves to a digital infrastructure, we don't 100% know whether we can actually physically maintain into the foreseeable future. Um, and I, th I think, Dan, if I can jump in, um, maybe, uh, Ronnie, I think we need to be careful not to presume that these new advances are being promoted as silver bullets. Mm -hmm. um, none of the stuff that you care about and all of the wisdom that you're bringing is supposed to get discarded because we now have DAOs. It's, we now have a new tool uh, to help. I, I think our challenge is to figure out, don't change what we think is important, but how do we use these new tools to you to to make the work we need to do more effective effective and uh and to to scale out not scale up but to replicate um faster and um i find it very exciting and and i i'm also a bit of a luddite i <clears throat> ronnie i was the guy that ran derivative desks where everyone laughed at me because I didn't know where the on switch was on my computer. So <laughs> I, uh, I, I, my tendency is not to embrace technologies, but um, I, I find this very hopeful. And I, you know, the, the, the creating the conditions is a, is a phrase that we use all the time. And, um, and yet we're, we're trapped in a system where the conditions are usually adverse to what we're trying to do. And, and so I, I don't, I'm not smart enough to know how this will all uh, unfold, but you know, there's a, there's a young guy in our course that just sort of blew my mind. I'm blanking on his name, but he's totally into this and, you know, it's all second nature. And, and so I, I don't know. I, I, I think we just need to be careful not to, uh, overinflate what these technologies are. They're just tools and, and it's on us to use them intelligently. But if there's a, an attractor, you know, if the Dow space is like a magnet attracting higher consciousness folks who are trying to use technology for good, as opposed to, you know, let's be honest, the, the, the Silicon Valley culture in technology is is not, despite claims of do no evil. Uh, I find it very hopeful. Um, I, lo I love I love that. It's probably um, a great place to to to, to um, wrap up. I guess um, I am very hopeful as well. Uh, I really believe humanity coordinating in a different way that we've never been able to do uh, is for me is, is, a, is a critical component mm. of our future and to regenerate the planet and to provide this, I like to call it the regenerative renaissance. I like uh, 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 that term a lot. Um, our existing systems are collapsing. When I, uh, and, and you, you guys all know this, uh, when, when we first, Came across, came to Haifa in 2019. This was pre-pandemic, and you know the story I would go out to people was, "Hey, our existing systems don't work. We need new ones." And I'd, and they'd go, "No, our existing system is fine." And I'd be like, "No, well, you know, there's this issue, that issue," and they're like, and then the pandemic hit, and the massive silver lining, right, to the pandemic is now everybody understands that the existing system is failing, and that's a. Uh, uh, um, a, a massive change um so we're accelerating into this change point and i believe everyone can feel that and change is painful um and i'm very mindful of that and that, that's a very tough thing i think for us all to to bear witness to um and to be part of but uh you know i'm focused on that beautiful sunrise the other side and I believe it's these it's these systems and systems like Haifa and other components that have been built by amazing people over the last four or five years that are all coming together now. And you know, they they're not coincidences; they're coincidences. The timing is 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 perfect. And these systems these systems coalescing, you know, now people really care about you know that comment that you can distribute value without using a bank account because you know. 
people understand that you know, the system isn't quite what, what they thought it was. So I remain really optimistic and I, I really appreciate you guys. I know you guys don't like these terms of leaders and thought leaders, but you, know, you guys are a decade ahead of uh, certainly me personally. And the work that we've done in Haifa is uh, highly influenced by the work of both of you. Um, and you know all of you, all that you guys have done for the movement. So, uh, you know the magnification aspect of the activities that you have been doing over the past decade and more uh, is really transferring into uh, you know some of the action that that we're taking at Haifa. So we're we're mm. you know built off the shoulder of giants, and we appreciate uh, you know everything that has come before us. Well, thank, thanks so much for this session. It was really um, educational. I'm still still not quite there. Like what I feel that like we, we, we need is um, a f analog, physical walk in the Tramontana Mountains together. Yeah, it's a three-day uh, three retreat. I, I, I keep dre dreaming into that, 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 that John just hops on a plane from New York, which um, up until a certain time in the year actually goes straight to Mallorca and um, while you're still in Ibiza, you can just come on a ferry. And we, we spend a couple of days um, in person together because then we can go um, really deep on, on all of this. But thank you so much for the start and wonderful. This is a good start. Together and um, no. thanks for the good work. Let's, to, let's... to be continued. Yeah. Pleasure. Okay. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks. Have a good day.